All right, Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 through 34, our subject lesson today. Therefore, I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body what you shall put on. Is not the life more than meat and the body more than raiment? Behold, the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are ye not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? Amen. Amen. I've been praying to get six feet tall for a long time. But I'm still praying. I'm, I believe God is a miracle worker. Amen. I told somebody, Reverend Jones, that if God can save me, he can make me six feet tall. It was a bigger miracle to save my soul. So you all going to look up one day and say, Reverend, is six feet two. Praise God. Verse 28, and why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow and how they toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which uh, today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek for your heavenly Father knows what you have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Let me read that again. Y'all ought to get happy off the reading of Scripture. I don't know, I don't know what's wrong with y'all. You, the Bible is good all by itself. But seek ye first. The kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be unto God. Today's message, today's message, how to handle your anxieties how to handle your anxieties. I just thank you so very kindly for your support. You may take relief of your duties. How to handle your anxieties. Friends, we all have anxieties and worries in life. The more we live and the more we go through life, we have to deal with some challenges and anxieties that sometimes can be overwhelming. But Jesus, in this particular passage of Scripture, forces us and prompts us to take our anxieties and put them in proper perspective and to lay our anxieties next to the greatness of our God. And when we shall lay our worries, our thoughts, our anxieties next to the greatness of our God, we'll find that God is greater than any problem, any worry, or any anxiety we'll ever have. Y'all ought to say amen right there. We're living in a world where people are suffering more with anxiety and panic attacks. Because of the stresses and cares of this world, that things can just seem to rush in on you like a flood and seem to overwhelm your heart, seem to cloud your mind and cloud your thinking and take you to a place where it seems that you can hardly breathe because you've got so much on you at one time. Friend, if that has not been your case in life, thank God for that because God has blessed you. But for many of us, uh, it, it, these anxieties will come just out of nowhere and they come in like a flood and just overwhelm you almost suddenly. I shall never forget that uh, some years ago I was flying uh, on my way. Tom and I were flying to uh, Salt Lake, Utah for me to do a leadership meeting and to preach. And uh, I never will forget sitting on the plane and uh, out of nowhere, a panic attack overwhelmed me. And I had never suffered from panic. I had never suffered from anxiety. I'd never suffered from panic attack. Flying, I fly all over, and it never bothered me. But in this instance, it literally felt like I was about to have a heart attack. I, I could not 
breathe. I couldn't get enough air in to save my life. Thank God Tommy was there with me and helped me to calm down. Had the stewardess bring me some ice and things like that. And, and literally, it got so overwhelming that I passed out on the plane. I passed out, and uh, thank God I did because I, I, I slept the rest of the way and, uh, and uh, came, came to, I did. <laughs> I did. It, that was the only thing that kept me because I literally thought I was going to have a heart attack. And when I sat and, 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 and I thought about it, he, as we were driving to the hotel, he asked me, well, what, what happened to you? What, were you sick or something? And the only thing I could think was I got so overwhelmed thinking about all of the stuff I had just finished at the church and all the stuff I still needed to get done and all of the, the people I needed to call back and all of the meetings I needed to schedule and all of the, 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 the documents I needed to write and all the sermons. And I just, I just, all of it came down on me at one time. And it felt like I was drowning and just being buried under the anxieties and the weight of life. And friend, I'm not the only one that has suffered that kind of situation. There are many of you in the room that you've gotten to the place where you're just, just frantic and just worried about stuff. And friend, I'm here to tell you the Lord has given us an answer for how to handle our anxieties. And that is that we ought to give it all over to God and seek first the kingdom of God. Stop worrying about the cares and affairs of this life. Stop worrying about the, the problems of this life and start focusing our minds upon God who can help us throughout all of our challenges. Amen ought to go right there. Oh, yes, friend, I know I'm not the only one because here in the text, Jesus is talking to a group of people that are under that type of pressure. They are living in a time in this first century A.D. where there is nothing but pressure from every side upon them. They are pressured politically. The Roman government has overtaken the, the Jewish government and taken, overtaken the Jewish land. And now they have the Roman government that is oppressing them and a Roman government that is, is now presiding over land that they know God has given to his people, but yet a pagan people that are unrighteous and unjust now rule over the land when it should be God's people that are ruling in the land. Politically, they know that they're under the hand of some wicked rulers, and that is causing them some anxiety. Does that sound familiar in, for those of us that are living today? The fact about it is that no matter what, what you think, donkey or elephant, all of them got some issues. Y'all ought to say amen there. Yeah, I don't, I, don't care, I don't care how in love with whatever political party you want to be in. At the end of the day, people that, that uh, are poor, people that are in trouble, people that are suffering, are left out of the equation by each one of them because each one of them just won't power. That's the truth. We're living with anxieties from every end. We're living, we're living with, with problems. They, they were living with problems financially. They were under, under, under such financial challenges that that not only was, was political issues at play, but also there were financial issues at play, that there was a wide gap between those that were rich and those that were poor. And most people during this day were just eking by from day to day. They didn't have much of anything, and they were suffering under, under the oppressive hand of not just wicked rulers, but also thieves and robbers that, that sat in high places. They had to deal with tax collectors that were overcharging them for their taxes. They were dealing with governors that were taking bribes under the table. They were dealing with people that were charging interest uh, at a high amount and were, were ba basically robbing the people of the little bit of money that they had. And if that wasn't bad enough, if they weren't just getting robbed at the government, they were getting robbed at the church. But when they would go to make their sacrifices, there were money changers at the temple that were taking double for the sacrifices, knowing that those poor people didn't have enough to bring the goats and bring the oxen and to bring the doves that they needed on the journey. And so they would charge them double for the sacrifices they were making. They were financially hurting. Does that sound familiar today? Today we're living under a, a, a financial oppression and financial disaster always, uh, we're always on the precipice of financial disaster. Gas prices are going up, but if the gas price doesn't offend you, when you go to buy a gallon of milk, when you go to buy some eggs, when you go to buy bread in the grocery store, that'll offend you for sure. Everything is going higher, 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 and the money is getting more and more scarce in your pockets. Say amen there. 
Yes, they were under, under political pressures. They were under financial pressures. They were, they were under anxieties from a social perspective because now uh, they, they are being frayed apart uh, even within because there were some people that felt that because they had a little title and felt that they had a little position and felt that since they had a little, uh, a, a little influence that they could put down those that did not have those things. And so, so now people were clamoring for title, position, and money in order that they could feel that they were worthwhile and, worth, uh, uh, and full of worth in life. And Jesus is speaking to a crowd that's under those type of anxieties and pressures. And he says, don't seek political power, don't seek financial power, don't seek position, but seek ye first kingdom of God. Here he gives us three ways we deal with our anxieties. Three ways. Number one is, number one, to deal with the anxiety. Number one, stop worrying. Stop worrying. Verse 25 through 27, stop worrying. He said, therefore, I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet of your body what you shall put on uh, is not the life more than meat and the body more than just raiment? He said, take no thought. It means don't worry. Literally, he says, don't worry about these material and temporal things. He said, don't, don't take thought for it. Now, Jesus is not suggesting that we not be responsible individuals. He is not suggesting that you walk around happy-go-lucky in life and you don't consider how you're conducting your life. But what he is saying is, don't have an overemphasis in your life on things, but rather understand that things God will provide in his own time. It's good to have things. It's good to be in good health. It's good to, to, to have uh, 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 materials and things of this sort. But what Jesus is saying is that you shouldn't worry about it and let those things consume you. Friend, we're living in a day when people are more worried about what they got on their body than they're worried about what they got in their heads. You ought to say amen there. We're living in an age where everybody is dressing for and living for an Instagram photo and not worrying about the life that we're supposed to have with God and have with each other. We spend more of our time and our effort trying to figure out what outfit to put on than we do in prayer trying to figure out how we can have a closer walk with God. He said, don't take thought of these things. What, what you shall eat. He said, he said now, now, now you shouldn't worry about certain things. You shouldn't have things overwhelming and consuming your mindset. Why? Because God will take care of you. In verse 26, he said, behold, the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap. He says, they don't plant any crops and they don't pick any crops. But yet God still feeds the little birds in the air. Then he said, neither uh, uh, nor uh, gather into barns. He said, they don't plow, they don't pluck, nor do they uh, uh, put up for later on. Barns are used to hold the grain for a rainy day and for later times. He said, they, they aren't worried about uh, putting stuff away. Now, Jesus is not saying that you shouldn't save your money. Yeah, you ought to save your money. But what he's saying is, you shouldn't hoard things that won't do you any good for later fact about it is, some of us, we got too much. Hmm? We don't have the issue that these people had. These people had very little. These people lived on far less than we have today, and that's why our prosperity gospel and theology doesn't work in the modern culture, because we have no concept of how they lived in the first century. They didn't have uh, hordes of stuff like we have, and the problem is, we have too much greed in our hearts and in our minds. At some point, how much is enough enough? How long are you going to lie, cheat, and steal just to keep adding up a bunch of stuff that one day you will have to pay the price for? This is what Jesus is teaching. He's teaching that we shouldn't be greedy in our life. We shouldn't be consumed with materialism. I saw a preacher, I saw a pre well, uh, I saw a fellow that, that stands and talks a little bit on Sundays. I had to qualify. They, I saw a fellow that stands and talks a little bit on Sundays, and, and my God, God, it, it, was, it was appalling to me. I, I believe in nice things, but now it, I, I, I just couldn't believe some of the stuff I saw. I, I, he, 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 had, he had on a suit. Now, honest to God, I wouldn't wear it to bed, uh, much less wear it on a Sunday morning. 
and uh, and he had on I, it just it was outrageous. He was driving. He was driving a, a Rolls Royce a convertible. He had on these Gucci glasses. He had on all these gold chains. It was it was just outrageous. And I said, Well, I got to see his church. And have mercy, Lord. And there he was. He, he had a, a video on where he had gone to the Louis Vuitton store. And the people at the Louis Vuitton store are walking behind him, carrying out the bags. And he's just smiling on the camera. Look at all. Look, they, they escorted me out with all of my stuff that I just bought. And I thought to myself, Reverend, do you mean to tell me that God called you to preach so you can have shopping sprees at the Louis Vuitton store? You, you mean to tell me God called you to preach so you can go and be flashy all day long? You think that's what God wants of us? No, friend. God wants us to love him and love his people and to serve him in righteousness. But I say it to you too. God did not save you. God does not bless you in order for you and I to be flashy. He does bless us so that we can bless somebody else. At some point, enough is enough. We've got to learn how to be satisfied. But when you're not satisfied, you'll worry about stuff. When you're not satisfied, you'll constantly be scheming and, and, and thinking about how you can get more stuff. And at some point, you've got to learn that if God can take care of the fowl, that, that means the little birds in the air, then God can and God will take care of you. In the, in the book of Exodus, there's an interesting story where the people of Israel were, were, were complaining. The, the children of God were complaining, saying that we had better provision back there in Egypt. And God said, I tell you what I'll do. Since y'all are worried about how you're going to eat out here in the wilderness, I'll prove to you that I am a God that will provide. Moses, tell them that they can go and get manna in the morning. Tell them they can get manna at noon. Tell them they can get manna at night. But tell them, Moses, all they need to do is eat for that moment. They don't store up anything for the next day and if they do the weasels will come in and the weevils will come in and eat it up because I want them to rely on me and not on themselves trust in the Lord with all thine heart lean not to thine own understanding but in all thy ways acknowledge him and he will direct thy path when you're worried about stuff all the time what you're saying to God is I got to worry about it God because I don't think you can handle it but when you learn how to stop worrying what you're saying is God I know you can and I know you will so I trust you Philippians chapter number 4 Verses 6 through 7 said, don't worry about anything, but in everything, through prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. And guess what? When you stop worrying about stuff, guess what God will do? He'll give you the peace of God, which surpasses every thought and understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. When you learn to stop worrying... God will give you peace that nobody else can understand. People will wonder, why are you so calm right now? Because I know God got it. Why are you not getting upset right now? Because I know God got it. Why are you not getting frustrated right now? Because I know God has it in his control. I don't know about tomorrow. I just live from day to day. I don't borrow from its sunshine for its skies may turn to grave. Many things. About tomorrow, I may not understand, but I know who holds tomorrow. And I know who holds my hand. Number two, not only stop worrying, but number two, start watching. Verse 28 and 30, look what he said. And why take you thought for raiment? Why are you worrying about your clothes and all of that stuff? Consider the lilies of the field. They grow they toil not, they, they don't have to work, neither do they spin, they don't sew up anything. And yet, I say unto you, Solomon, King Solomon, in all of his glory, didn't have on the type of beautiful garments that they have on. Wherefore, if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, Shall not he much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? If God can take care of little birds, and if God can take care of flowers out in the field, you who are the crown jewel of God's creation, why don't you know that God will take care of you? 
The reason, friend, I, I despise uh, the thought of uh, Darwin's evolutionary theory is because Darwin says that God created animals and man evolved from animals. But that's not how it happened. God created all of creation, and then on the last day, he created, on the sixth day rather, he created man out of the dust of the earth. He intelligently and he willfully and thoughtfully designed and made man from the dust of the earth, separate and distinct and different from every part and every other of the created order. God made man his crown jewel of creation, and then when he made man, he said you will have dominion over everything. So understand this. So if God has all of this other creation, and he makes sure that's all right, then you understand this. You who are the crown jewel of his creation, surely he'll make sure you're all right. Not only from our created standpoint, but also from our individual standpoint, that God is so concerned about me and so concerned about you that he knows the number of hair on your head. He can count everything and knows every sinew, every nerve, every part of your body, every bone in your body. God knows about all parts of you, not just in your body, but your mind and your spirit. And God knows exactly what you need and God will take care of you. Jesus uses this example of clothing to demonstrate to them that God clothes, God God bedecks all of creation with his glory. And if he does that for his creation, then surely he will do that for those that are his children. I'm here to tell you this, children of God, that when we recognize this, that God is not just good sometimes, he's good all the time. He's not just good in some ways, he's good in every way and in everything he does. He's not just merciful at moments, he's merciful at all times and, and his mercy endures throughout all generations. And if you would but just watch God work, he's got enough evidence to prove that he'll do exactly what he says. People that worry too much haven't been watching well enough. Let me say it again. People that worry too much haven't been watching well enough. Let me say it again. People that worry too much haven't been watching well enough. Pastor, what do you mean? When you are watching God work, it builds up your confidence that God knows exactly what he's doing. The psalm had said it this way in Psalm chapter, or Psalm, excuse me, Psalm number eight, verses one through three. He says, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. The whole earth is full of thy glory. Uh, the psalmist goes on in Psalm number eight, and he talks about the greatness and the glory and, and, the, and the wonders of God, and he, he talks about God's work in creation. And he says, God, when I look out in creation, I can say this, you are a great awesome and mighty God. And friend, if you just watch God, if you just pay attention, you will have to know that God is more than able to take care of your little problems and mine. If you woke up this morning and, and were able to go out and feel the heat of the sun on your body, but know that it was warm, but you didn't burn up, it's because God has been taking care. Y'all ain't said nothing, but I'm preaching nice. If you were able to, to wash your face this morning, and I hope you did, if you were able to wash your face this morning and put a little water on your face, do you know that's because God has put the, the, the properties of, of water and, and condensation and, and rain into motion and so that we have water that, that will cover this earth? It's because God is at work. If you went out and you felt the cool breeze that, that blew on your face, it's because God caused the wind to blow. If you were able to hear the rustling of the trees, it was because God caused the, the trees to, to rustle in the wind. If you were able to walk and see all of God's azure blue sky, it's God at work. And I'm here to tell you, God has been doing wondrous things a long time. But not if you just watch creation, but if you just watch your own life. Because there are many in this room today that you know you're here right now because God has been working in your life. If you just tell the truth about it, that God has been good to you. And as the old folks would say, he's been better to me than I've been to my own self. I, I wasn't supposed to go this far, but I feel all right here. 
When I think about where God has brought me from, when I think about what God has done, when I think about the ways God has made, when I think about the doors God has opened, I can't help but to trust him because he's been too good. So I can say it like this. He's never failed me yet. That's why I trust him. That's why I learned to not worry about stuff. That's why when I start worrying about stuff, I learn how to just give it over to Jesus. And I know he'll work it out. My dad is gone, but I got a God that's still working for me. My grandmama been gone 20 years now. She died March 20th, 2002. Mama been gone 20 years, but I'm still here. God has been taken care. Number three. You got to watch him. Just watch him. If you're worried right now, then just look around you and see all that God has done. I know you got trouble now, but God has done some wonderful things in your life already. I know you got some problems now, but God has already done some great things already. I know some of you got sickness in your body, but there's some folk around you that God healed them, and I'm a witness he can heal you too. There I was on a plane, and I told you I had an anxiety attack, but I should have come to myself and realized I had been on a whole lot of other planes, and it wasn't the pilot, it wasn't the, the stewardess, it was God's grace that kept those planes in the air. There I was worried about stuff going on at the church and I should have remembered this, that God been taking care of his church long before I was born and this church will survive long after I'm gone. No matter what I do or don't get done, it'll be all right. No matter who get mad, they'll be all right. No matter who get upset, it's going to be all right because God will. I mean, you've been to the cemetery and had to leave loved ones in the cemetery. Tell me how you're living today by God's grace. Some of you had to leave mama there. Mama used to hold your hand and you had to walk away and leave her there. Who's holding your hand now? God. Some of your daddy is gone. Daddy used to hold you and make you feel safe. And you had to leave daddy out there in the cemetery. Glory to God. Who's holding you now, God? God will. Number three, I, I'm done. Not just stop worrying. Start watching. Just look. Just look around you. Hadn't God done wonderful things? But number three, seek his way. Verse 31 through 34. Therefore, take no thought saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. He said, now you got some neighbors that that's all they care about is money, clothes, food. That's all they care about. That's all they want. That's all some people live for. Money, clothes, cars, houses. That's all they think about. And they have an empty life. Do you know you can have a bunch of stuff and still not have a good life? Verse 32. For all these things that the Gentiles seek for your heavenly father knows what you have need of all of these things. And since he's your father, he'll take care of those things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added. You don't have to steal them. You don't have to take them. You don't have to lie to get them. All these things God will add unto you. You don't have to compromise your morals. 
You don't have to lower your standards. If you basically what Jesus said, if you live right, God will bless you right. That word seek in the Greek really comes from a Hebrew term that has two meanings. In the Hebrew, it means to search for that which was lost. But then also in the Hebrew, the second meaning, it, it means to actively go after something as a goal or, a, or as an aim in life. And what Jesus is literally saying is that your aim in life should be to go in the way and in the direction that God has called you to. And if you go where God tells you to go, then God will add to you what you need. It works like this. When you learn to stop chasing stuff and start instead chasing the will of God, then what happens is the stuff that you were one time chasing will start to chase you. <laughs> Y'all missed that. I said when you learn to start chasing God's will instead of chasing stuff, the stuff that you were chasing will start chasing you. Why? Because in the word of God, the Bible says that blessings will overtake you. Oh, I wish I had a witness here. Well, why would blessings overtake me? It's because I'm seeking the blesser rather than the blessing. And when I'm seeking the blesser, he gives me exactly what I need. Because his ways are not my ways. And his thoughts are better than my thoughts. And furthermore, not only are his ways higher and better than my ways, because the stuff I wanted was too small. Because God wanted to do more in my life and for me than ever I wanted to do for myself. But also it's because of this. Because God's plan for my life was bigger than my plan. That's why he said, I know. The plans that I have for you, plans to bless you and plans to give you a future and to give you a hope and not to curse you. Do you know that God has something in store for your life that not even you can understand? That God will do things in your life that you don't even know you can do. Why? Because it's God at work. I didn't mean to go this far. I done got happy here. But it's God at work. The reason some of you got the jobs you have, it's God at work. The reason some of you are living where you are is because it's God at work. The reason that some of you are where you are right now is not because of how good you are. It's not because of how great you are. It's simply this. If somebody asks you, how did you get it? You tell them it's God at work. I didn't get here because of education. I didn't get here because I'm so wonderful. I didn't get here because I'm so great, but I got to where I am because I learned how to put my hand in the master's hand. I learned how to trust in Jesus. I learned how to depend on the Lord. I've learned how to turn it all over to him and he will, he'll work it out. Can I get a witness? Is there anybody here? That really learned the words of the hymn. Not just what's on the page. But you learned it because you lived it. Hold to his hand. God on changing hand. Build your hopes on things eternal. Hold on to God on changing hand. Anybody holding on? Storm may rise. I'm holding on. Wind may blow, but I'm holding on. Enemies all around, but I'm holding on. The devil don't like it, but that's all right. I got a God who will take care of me. I, I, I got a God who watching over me. I got a God who provides for me. Not some things, not most things, but everything. Everything I need, the Lord will provide. Goodbye now. Have a good holiday. But I want to tell you one last thing. When I, in awesome wonder, 
consider all the world the Lord has made. I see the stars. I hear the rolling thunder. Thy power throughout the universe displayed. Then sing my song, my Savior God to be. How great, how great thou art. How great, how great thou art. If you want to stop worrying, if you want to go to bed tonight, if you want to have a peaceful sleep, you stop telling people about your problems. Stop telling about all your issues. Stop telling about all your burdens. And start telling people, I serve a God who's able to take care. Able. 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 Ain't he able? See ya. See ya. Yeah. I sure didn't mean to do that today. I said I was getting out of here early. But something got a hold of me when I thought about the days when I was worried. When I thought about moments I've been in depression and it felt like I was in a dark hole. And some days y'all didn't know it but I had to stand here and preach while I cried my way through sermons. I would have to go home and cry to sleep at night. But I'm here to tell you that God will. He'll pick you up. God will. He'll give you joy. God will. He'll give you peace in your mind. Anybody a witness? Won't he give you peace? Won't he give you joy? Won't he try tears from your eyes? Can you just wave at me if you a witness and say, I'm a witness? Yes, he will. He will. Hey, hey. Hey, hey. hey, hey. Um, I know he will. I know he will. All right. You, you ought to trust him. Don't worry. Everything. It'll be all right. I don't know what has you worried. But if you just trust God, there's enough witnesses in here that will tell you life hadn't been perfect, but God is still good. 